I'm going to run through three and a half years of business experience in 30 minutes. So take notes, take pictures. A little bit about me, I'm from the US and now I live in Brazil with my husband who is there. And if any of you are taking the cruise to Salvador, drop me a line because that's where I live. I used to teach English as a second language offline. So there's me with a couple of my students and it was a logical next step for me to just take my work online. And I'm passionate about capoeira, which is an Afro-Brazilian martial art and dance. I will not do a cartwheel, I'm not appropriately dressed, but there's me upside down. EspressoEnglish.net aims to teach English to busy people through ebooks and online courses. The lessons are short and sweet. And you can see that it has grown. What you don't see is the six months of zeros that preceded this graph. Okay, so just imagine like a flat line on the left. As you can see, there was really no moment where it kind of just took off. It was just kind of a long cycle of continuing to work, improve, and learn and do better. And so I'm gonna share some of the things I learned during this process with you guys today. I'm gonna cover three areas. One is audience building. So if you're just getting started, this is the one for you. Next one is course creation and launch. And then finally, if you've already got an info product on the market, 10 strategies for growing it and scaling it. But first I wanted to address a concern that some people have, which is information overload. You know, some people say that we have the internet, information is out there, it's free. Why should anyone buy a course? You can't sell courses now. But the self-directed e-learning market was worth nearly $36 billion in 2011. And I couldn't find a more recent stat, but it's apparently growing globally. So if you have the skill of teaching and of making complicated information easy to understand and getting people results, there's absolutely room for you in this market. And my perspective is that the larger the ocean of information, the greater the need for a guide. And as a teacher, you are that guide. So even though you can find almost anything on the internet out there for free, people want to be guided through it. They want to be taught. Um, so don't let that hold you back from trying to sell ebooks or online courses. So let's start with audience building or finding your potential students. Keep in mind that people buy courses from people who they know, like, and trust. So as you're building your audience, you're getting more numbers of people, you want to build a relationship with your audience. People have to know you, like you, and trust you. They're not just numbers, they're not just statistics. So let that guide all of your actions as you're building your audience. Now there are two main ways to get traffic. One is what I'll call publish and hope which is blogging, YouTube, podcasting, and social media, and you just kind of hope that people magnetically flock to your site. And the other method I'm gonna call go out and get them. So that is guest blogging, appearing on other people's podcasts, joint ventures, advertising, participating in forums, even cold contacting, and any previous customers or clients who maybe you've worked with before in other capacities. Um, this gets you in front of your potential customers much faster. And I recommend actually doing things from both columns. You should absolutely, in the beginning, try to partner with people who are already talking to the audience who you want to talk to. And you should be developing your own content so that when those people come to your site, uh, they can delve into your archives and um, learn a lot from you. Now, what did I do? I kept publishing and hoping. I did not do anything from the second column. And nowadays, Espresso English has over 300,000 visitors a month, but as you can see, it took a long time to get there. I mean, it's virtually flat in the beginning. And if I could go back and do it over, I would have done more guest blogging, partnerships, joint ventures, anything to kind of speed up that process. I would have done things from both of those columns that you saw on the previous slide. So this was a very long haul and there was a way to speed it up. I'm telling you guys now so that you can skip maybe the first few data points there. An email list is essential when you're building your audience. No excuses. Have an email sign up from day one. Sign up on Aweber. I use MailChimp. And my first ever email went to just 12 people. Didn't start with the bang. Nowadays, it has over 50,000 subscribers, and I haven't missed an email in three and a half years. 
I think you should think of your site and your list as kind of the central point and all your other activities, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, whatever you're doing, you always want to point people back to your site, encourage people to come back to your site, sign up for your list for more valuable content. So I mention my site in every piece of content I produce. I mention it verbally in podcasts, mention it verbally in YouTube videos, to just encourage people to come to Espresso English, which is kind of the mothership. And I like to have multiple opt-in opportunities. So I use a pop-up. If you're not a fan of pop-ups, you can use a pop-in or maybe some of these other methods. Um, I use a sticky sidebar. So if at any time when someone is learning from me, they decide they want to learn more, it's easy for them to sign up. They don't have to search for it. So what should you send your email list? Well, when I started, and this is what I still do, I just send them my latest content. I'll preface it with a couple of personal thoughts, a couple of tips, a little bit of encouragement. If you don't have any content that you've published recently, people also appreciate receiving a curated roundup of links. So maybe you didn't publish anything new, but you know of four great articles in your field that your audience would appreciate. And people appreciate getting that. Um, they don't want to go trolling through the internet like you probably have, and they like getting that content. But the key is to be consistent. I used to email twice a week. I'm going down to once a week. If you can do it on the same day of the week, it's even better because people will start to look forward to that email. But just be consistent. Provide consistent value to your audience. And take the opportunity to deeply engage with your list while it's still small. So I've got 50,000 people now. I can't get on the phone with all of them. But when your list is just 12 or 20, you can call every single one of those people. You can do a free Google Hangout. There are a ton of possibilities. And not only will you be providing some massive value, but you'll be creating some super fans who are going to become some of your best customers and brand advocates. So if you're just starting out, take advantage of the opportunity to engage in that way with your email list. All right, so you've got a little bit of an email list going. Now you want to get paid for your expertise by launching, creating and launching a course. What topic to teach? Well, you probably already have ideas, but an even better way is to ask your audience what they want to learn. So you'll notice that some of your content is more popular than other content. That's a clue. You can survey your audience and ask them directly, what would you guys like a course on? And I also do a what's your biggest difficulty email. The first email that someone gets from me asks, what's your biggest struggle in learning English? And I encourage them to reply. I reply to those replies. But this kind of helps me keep my finger on the pulse of my audience and know what needs they have, which I can then serve with online courses. But don't get too hung up on the perfect topic or angle, OK? Some people try to be really unique and it has to be different from everything that's ever been produced ever. You can always tweak your topic later after you get feedback maybe from your first group of students. How big an email list should you have before you try to launch something? A couple of guidelines. I recommend having at least 100 people, preferably 1,000, but I've seen people do great launches with smaller lists. But the key is who you've been regular, regularly emailing and engaging with. So it's really the engagement of the list that matters much more than the size. When I launched my first course, I think I had 1,700 subscribers. And I'll tell you how many actually bought it in a minute. But first, a quick mindset check. We all know that the expectations sometimes don't live up to the reality, as anyone who's had a website emergency knows. Um, if you launch your first course and the numbers are small, that does not mean that the launch was not successful. And I fell into this fallacy because when I first launch, launched, I launched to 1,700 people. 100 people started to sign up and most of them didn't finish. The number of people who actually finished the sign up and paid was 17. So I thought that was terrible and a bad sign and clearly my courses were crap and nobody would ever buy them. That is uh, not correct thinking. Small numbers simply means it's a start which you can then learn from and improve on. And I'm so glad that Natalie shared some of her students' actual numbers. Usually, the first iteration of a course only gets 12 people, 7, 10, maybe 20. So sometimes when we read these case studies with these huge six-figure launches, 
It's great, we can learn from them, we can implement the strategies, but don't compare your launch to theirs, okay? So if I had stopped at 17, I would not have gotten to the point where Espresso English is now a full-time income for myself and my husband. Some people wonder, if you're selling content and you're giving away content, what, how, to, how do you make the distinction between the free stuff and the paid stuff? Here are a couple of guidelines. You can give away less frequent content and charge for more frequent. That's the most logical idea. It's not always necessarily better. You might get burned out on producing a ton of content. You can charge for, or you can give away more general stuff, uh, which is still valuable, and charge for a more specific, detailed, really step-by-step -step plan. One thing I do is I give away a more basic format, so I give away five-minute YouTube videos, and I charge for a more developed format, which is videos, transcripts, quizzes, homework, um, and kind of some more interactive elements, and give away some limited interaction with you, such as a little bit of email, maybe some blog comments, or a group um, uh, webinar, and charge for more interaction with you. If you're doing any sort of one-on-one -on -one mentoring, coaching, if you're looking over people's work, that should be part of your paid program. So I hope these things help show the distinction between what you might want to give away and what you might want to charge for. Now, I sold all of my courses through pre-selling. Namely, I put up a sales page, I sent the students to it, they paid first, and then I created and delivered the course in increments over time. And this was great because I essentially got paid to create my own products, which are then now selling over and over again. Now, two keys if you want to do this. One is you have to communicate very clearly with your students, so set the expectations. I told my students they would be receiving 30 lessons in 30 days, and they wouldn't get access to everything up front, it would be dripped out over the course of 30 days. And be certain that you can deliver. So you need to have a pretty strong work ethic, pretty strong self-discipline. I recommend if it's your first time, take a week to create a couple of sample lessons so that you see how long it takes you to do each lesson. Uh, does it take you two hours to do a lesson or two days? You don't know until you try it. And um, try to get ahead. I've left lessons to the last minute uh, far too many times, but I will tell you it's the best productivity hack when you know you have students who have already paid for the course expecting tomorrow's lesson. So don't do that. Try to get ahead. A brief word on pricing. The only way to figure out what people will actually pay is not to ask them. It's to put, them in, put the product in front of them and ask them to pay for it. And people will vote with their wallets, essentially. Um, people get hung up on pricing strategy. Just pick a price that's reasonable and is comparable to other products on the market. I started with a $30 course, for example. $30 for 30 lessons sounded good to me. And which reflects the value the student will get. So if it's kind of a basic course, maybe that's a lower price product. If it's something that's going to transform someone's life and career, then that should maybe be a higher price product. And there is a good article on Medium called The Ultimate Guide to Price Strategy. If you're interested in more of the technical details about the psychological details about pricing, check that out on Medium. But just pick a price and put it in front of your, your potential students, and you'll find out whether it works or not. But you can double your sales with a deadline. So have a specific date when the price goes up, or the doors close, or maybe some bonuses that you're offering go away. Don't use all three. Just pick one and go with it. I usually do the price going up, so I'll have a special early bird price. Once it goes up, uh, it stays open. I don't like to open and close my courses. Uh, but it is a big motivation for people to get in at the early price. Be honest. Don't use false scarcity. There are some tactics out there which can be very profitable, but which I'm not comfortable using that kind of trick the user into thinking there's some scarcity. And always send a last chance email. It seems kind of cheesy, but it works. And I found that people appreciate a friendly reminder of the last chance to get the discount or the bonus. Um, and the last chance email is usually, usually responsible for 30, sometimes even 40% of my sales on a launch. And when I say double sales, I really mean double sales. So these were five consecutive launches that I did. The red ones had no deadline, and the green ones did. What's interesting is that these last two green ones, the price was actually three times the price of that red one. But it wasn't the price that drove the sales. It was perhaps the offer 
and the deadline. So having a deadline really does double your sales. There's no magical launch formula, but this is the one I like to use. I usually do it over two or three weeks. If you do a shorter one, a lot of people will miss it. And I'll have a coming soon email to build anticipation. Then I usually announce the course, and the people who will sign up at this point are probably your super fans, your biggest followers. I like to send a free sample so that people know exactly what they're signing up for. And if you don't want to send a free sample, you can also send a lesson list that uh, shows people exactly what they're going to learn, uh, how they're going to benefit, and it should whet the appetite for your course. I will send some related content uh, to keep providing value, as well as inviting them to join the course. By this point in the launch, you'll probably have gotten some questions. And so you can send an email addressing common questions about the course. The purpose is to overcome objections. And then, of course, the last chance email to get those last minute signups. Now, the technical details, how to sell and deliver it, you have two main options. One is to do it on your own WordPress site with a plugin like one of these. You guys can look them up later. The other option is to use a third party platform like those. Don't get too hung up on this decision either. The important thing is to get your course out there and selling. And I'll just say this, if you're reasonably comfortable with technology, do it on your own site. If you have the budget, hire someone to set it up for you. If you're clueless about technology and you don't want to spend any money, do it on a third party platform. Get it out there and selling and then you can always migrate later. Now, about creating the lessons. The lessons are your most important task for the day, so do them during your best creative hours. It's very easy to get tied up in other little details and leave the lesson creation process until 10 o'clock at night when you're already kind of sleepy. Don't do that. Do them during your best creative hours, and I've found it helps me to use a standard operating procedure. So this is what it looks like for me. Uh, I spend about an hour and a half researching and writing the lesson do some video slides, record the audio, put it together with the video, uh, write the exercises, set it up on WordPress, and schedule the email to go out. And it takes me, without fail, between four and five hours. Uh, so I know exactly how long I need to create a lesson. And of course, some of this could eventually be outsourced when um, I want to get that off my plate. But uh, this will just help you go through the process and not skip anything or not forget anything. A couple of best practices. I like to provide my lessons in three formats, video, audio, and text, so that people can consume it in whatever format they're most comfortable with. I recommend keeping your lessons short, usually under 20 minutes. And if you have a topic that is longer than that, break it up into a couple of different lessons. You should organize your lessons well and guide the student through them. Sometimes I'll include an introduction video which tells the student how to take the course. That might sound silly if you're a very highly motivated self-learner, but people actually appreciate having that guidance. Try to include some activities, quizzes, worksheets, uh, as well as some interaction with you. Maybe um, a Facebook group where they can ask questions, maybe uh, monthly webinars or something like that, but people like to interact with their teacher. And finally, don't forget to get feedback during and after your course, because this is what's going to help you make it better to be able to serve your students better and also sell more. This is my post-course survey. I ask what exactly they liked, how it helped them. This is great material for getting testimonials. I have a general question about how the course could be improved, and then I ask them to get really specific. If they could request one lesson to be added, what would it be? So this helps me discover if there's anything that's lacking, missing, wasn't adequately covered in the course, and then I can revise it and make it better. OK, so you've got a course up. You've got your 17 students in the door. Now, how do you grow it? What next? I'm going to go over 10 advanced strategies for maximizing both your impact, your reach, and your revenue. I've done about six of these, and then four of them I'm still exploring myself. The first one is just rinse and repeat, create more products. Um, I would just keep asking my students, what do you want to learn about next? My first course was on travel, the next one I did was business, and I just kept going. So that's my full suite of products. And you will find that a lot of people who like your work will buy multiple things from you. And of course, you should get better at doing it every time. 
If you don't have one yet, you should set up an autoresponder, which sends people some of your best free content early in the email sequence, provide a lot of value, and then invite people to go deeper by taking one of your courses. I struggled for a long time with selling, and I finally nailed my philosophy, which is that my paid product should be always present but never pushy. So this is what it looks like in my autoresponder. Um, I have a little introduction. That's the free lesson, 100 uh, answers to common English questions. And then if someone wants more phrases, they can take the Everyday English Speaking course. That's a paid course. And then on the side, I have uh, buttons for each of my paid courses. So there's always the opportunity to click. It's always present, but I don't use really high pressure sales tactics. I don't want to be pushy about it. And this seems to be a nice balance between providing content as well as encouraging people to go deeper. A third tactic is to add uh, an appetizer. Some people call this a tripwire. I like appetizer better. An appetizer is a small product under $10 that's kind of a no-brainer to buy. So what I use is two grammar books, which are actually just a compilation of posts from my site, uh, and audio for $1. So given the normal price of textbooks, that's a really good deal, and about 120 people every month take me up on that offer. That's a low risk way for someone to become, to turn from a consumer of your content into someone who has paid a little bit and received even more value in return. It's a fundamental change in the relationship you've had, you have with that person. And of course, inside the appetizer, encourage people to continue and get the main course. Another tactic is to bundle products. I have one course which has two levels, and then I bundle them together, levels one and two. Someone can get a discount if they buy them both together. And I was really surprised when I ran the stats for this page, 80% of the customers choose the highest price option, which is why it's labeled most popular, because it is. And it's a win-win, because they are getting a bit of a discount, they're getting more material, and I'm also getting a higher transaction value. So you can bundle your products if you have more than one. Another example of bundling, I put all my products together into the complete program. It's just everything. If you want to buy everything on my site, you can do it for $227. It's a 35% discount. And when I first put this up, I thought, no one's going to buy at that price point. My students, maybe they don't have a ton of money. They're not used to buying things online. But you'd be surprised. It's responsible for about 30% of my revenue. And I actually added something where I will, when someone buys this, I send them a USB drive with all the files downloaded onto it. And people have really appreciated that little touch as well. Another way you can grow is to raise prices. This makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But one way that you can become more comfortable with it is to actually improve the course, which you probably want to do anyway, and then raise the price. Of course, include a last chance for people to get in at the current price before you raise it. And you might be pleasantly surprised. People might buy even more at the higher price. Another way to raise prices is to offer a regular and a premium version of the course side by side. So maybe you have just the lessons for $50 and lessons plus um, webinars plus a consulting session for 150 or 250 when you put them side by side, there will always be some percentage of people that wants the top one. And people can kind of choose what best meets their needs. You can also implement a monthly membership. Uh, that can take the form either of a community, if your following is the type that wants to interact with each other, or a content subscription. This is what I've got going on right now. Somebody pays $20 a month and they get 12 lessons which are different from the ones on the free site. Now, a membership is a bit of a hard sell. And your initial sign-up numbers might be lower, but you should see some retention and greater customer lifetime value. When I launched my membership, it had half as many sign-ups as I expected. So I was kind of like, ah, I don't know if this was a hit. But four months later, 93% of them are still in the program. So that's obviously a good sign that they are continuing to receive value and they're happily continuing to pay for the subscription. A little bit more advanced, uh, if you can segment your list, in other words, gather some information about your email list. Are they beginners? Are they advanced? What is their reason for learning? What they're studying? What are their interests? Then you can start to 
to send more specialized and more targeted emails that are really tailored to people's interests. And one thing that I use is I use triggered emails based on subscriber activity. So if someone clicked a course and didn't buy it, a couple days later they get an email automatically with some more free content related to that course as well as an invitation for them to ask me any questions about it. Um, so based on their behavior, I can then deliver the most appropriate content via email and that can all be automated. Once you have some traffic, you have some sales, you can also explore conversion rate optimization. The only thing I have to say about this is to make sure to test your messaging, not just the page format and the colors and the button placement. I really think that the message and the offer is really what hooks people to want to take a course, to want to participate and get that benefit um, out of the course. And a lot of people kind of skip over it, they just want to test the sales page format. Um, Noah Kagan has a great case study on his blog where he tried to launch a course, it was about online entrepreneurship, and it had an abysmal conversion rate. And he surveyed people and asked why they didn't buy. Based on the feedback, he revised his messaging and then relaunched the course, the same course, and had a smash hit. So it really wasn't the product, it was the messaging and the positioning. And consider working with a consultant. There are people who specialize in conversion rate optimization. So instead of learning everything about it yourself, you can hire someone to help you with the process. You can start to get into paid advertising at this point. Um, I recommend having ads that go to your email list and then move people towards a purchase, not doing ads straight to a purchase. Remember what I said about people knowing, liking, and trusting you. They have to know, like, and trust you before they want to give you money. So getting on the email list first is a way to build that relationship. But if you do this, paid ads, don't go nuts. Track your numbers to make sure your return on investment is positive. I experimented with Facebook and Google ads, poured a couple thousand dollars into it, was all excited. I said, now I'm going to scale. Um, and then I tracked the sales that came in through those ads and I was actually bleeding money so I stopped the ads but you really want to track and make sure that you are acquiring customers either at break even or at a profit. And then finally uh, the tenth way to grow is to consider licensing. If schools, universities, or companies would benefit from the training materials you've created, you can approach them and send some sample material or maybe offer to do a free seminar for them. Again, you give before you ask. Um, I have not done this yet. I'm exploring the possibility, but I will say that before starting to license your content, make sure you get a written agreement uh, reviewed by a lawyer, just because licensing can be very lucrative, very beneficial for both sides, but you want to have everything down in writing so that there's no misunderstandings. So now go create an awesome info product business. You have everything you need. If you want to get in touch with me, there's my uh, business site, my personal site, and my Twitter. I am more than happy to answer questions, give some more tips for your particular situation. Um, just connect with me by those methods. Thank you.